uh, this, this morning, Stuart, doing a fabulous job. And thanks you to all the speakers earlier on and to Tom behind the scenes, who's uh, managing us all really, really well. What struck me uh, about the talk so far is the wonderful opportunity that there is for collaboration um, uh, across the, the, the waters um, in surgical trials. And also credit to everybody for keeping exactly to time. I'll try to do likewise. Um, so what I've been asked to talk about is um, studies within a trial and developing the methods of surgical trials, which as Stuart mentioned, uh, Jane has touched on on a number of occasions. Um, and Jane's examples has been uh, the, the leaf on the tree has been the leaves on the tree has been a very good example of the, 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 the wealth of methods research that can be incorporated into surgical trials, because there is an urgent need to build the evidence base as to how we plan, do, con uh, analyze, and share the findings of randomized trials and not just in surgery. Um, this is a, a perhaps a, a review that shows some of the current state of play with regards to randomized trials in surgery published between 2008 and 2020. And this group picked up the trials um, in two journals with the highest impact factor in general medicine, as well as six specialist key journal uh, specialities. And they had included, they included almost 400 trials. And just by way of some of the context that this review found. So they found that registration in trials, um, about 62% of trials were registered prior to the conduct. So a long way to go in terms of registering trials. They found there was a discrepancy between the registered and the reported primary trial outcome in a third of the trials. They found that the estimated relevant, relevant relative treatment effect of 50%. So, so it, it, it's finding that the trial is powered to detect large potential treatment effects. And I guess the question we have to ask there is, are they reasonably sized treatment effects that we expect the intervention might be able to achieve? And are there much lower treatment effect values that might also be clinically significant? I suspect there are. Um, the sample size of studies are relatively uh, uh, small. Um, so the median projected sample size was 144 patients, but a very wide range. And again, the, so long as the sample size is adequately is adequate for the question that's asked and the power that is uh, being sourced, then that's absolutely fine. But they tend to be on the smaller side surgical trials than other settings. Um, most sorry, um, most trials um, did not control for uh, a surgeon a, a experience. Um, uh, um, 60, about, sorry, about 15% of trials used a, a, an experience cutoff level and uh, only about 7% used some pre-trial training. And within this review, they found that the details of the trial intervention were limited. Um, uh, uh, in most of the trials that were reported. So that's the current state of play according to this review um, uh, uh, in terms of some of the challenges that surgical trials face. But of course, that also introduces wonderful opportunity. We have mentioned earlier on and been touched on Jane's talk and David's talk around you know, the recruitment and retention of participants in trials, uh, in surgical trials. Um, only about 50% of, uh, of initiated surgical trials reach the predetermined participant number set by the researchers themselves. Um, of the, in, in another study of 395 surgical trials, 21% uh, were discontinued early, most commonly owing to poor recruitment. And there are similar reported problems with recruitment in placebo-controlled surgical uh, trials. Um, again, and this might not be a surprise, but one of the most common reasons um, of, for missing data in uh, clinical trials in surgery is patient-initiated withdrawal. Um, so I'm really sure to hear Donna's talk around that patients, you know, have been in, expressed a strong interest in participating in uh, in surgical trials. 
just to point out that these challenges in recruitment and attention to surgical trials are by no means unique to trials and surgery. They're ubiquitous across clinical trial areas and settings. I think one of the major challenges within the surgical trials community is the equipoise and equipoise um, being genuine uncertainty re regarding the comparative therapeutic merit of the intervention versus the control in a trial. And it can be present in patients and in treating clinicians and within clinicians itself, it can be at the community of uh, surgical clinicians um, or that broad community of people involved in RCTs in surgery. And it can also be at the individual um, uh, uh, clinician level, individual surgeon level, for example. And um, that clinical, that ch challenges in equipoise uh, are, are, are one of the most challenging barriers to trials uh, of surgical interventions. Uh, one of the other challenges is uh, considering the surgeon skill and uh, there's this dual concept of accounting for the proficiency of surgeons in the trial and determining the effectiveness of the intervention or the procedure itself. Um, but there is good evidence now, mounting evidence, that surgical skill can be accurately assessed and some really interesting studies particularly focusing on the use of video and its role in uh, determining uh, levels of uh, expertise uh, pre-trial um, so that they're try trying in some way to at least um, recognize and reflect on mechanisms for controlling in some way for surgeon skill. With these challenges and no trial setting is without its own specific challenges. Um, and surgery shouldn't be seen as a particularly challenging area. I know colleagues, for example, who do clinical trials in um, you know, intensive care settings, those who do trials in you know, uh, myocardial infarction, some of those other things, some of those trial areas also have their own unique challenges. But with those challenges, I think comes wonderful opportunities. And I think the challenges in surgical trials um, gives us opportunities to develop the methods in how we plan, do, analyze, and share the findings of trials in surgery. And what I want to talk for a few minutes about is the example of the SWATs, which Jane mentioned. And what we're talking about when we're talking about trials methodology and developing the evidence base underpinning the different steps in the trial from how we prioritize what questions are important or need answering from the perspective of different stakeholders, all the way through to how we plan the trial, how we conduct the trial, how we analyze the trial, to how we might share the findings of that trial, get that trial findings into practice. All of those steps are processes in a trial. And we need to look at those processes, process steps within a trial and ask what's the evidence base underpinning each of those processes. And often we find that there is a, a massive gap in high quality evidence informing some of the decisions we might take about how we perform each of these steps or processes within a trial. So in the same way, you're conducting a randomized trial to provide a high quality, rigorous research approach to answering a clinical question, we should be asking and applying high quality methods to questions about how we plan, do, share, analyze, and share the findings of trials. So bring that scientific method into those process steps. So one example of that is in the SWOT, which Jane had mentioned, uh, in, in, including in a particular trial. So what is a SWOT? Well, a SWOT is a self-contained research study that is embedded within a host trial with the aim of evaluating or exploring alternative ways of delivering or organizing a particular trial process or multiple trial processes. Um, this is a helpful uh, document and there are a number of documents in this from Trial Forge uh, based, based in Aberdeen and run by Sean Shreek and colleagues. Um, and very helpful resources in um, uh, embedding primary trials methodology questions within host clinical trials. So why do we need SWATs? Well, for a number of reasons. So as I mentioned, there's very, relatively little evidence and relatively little high quality evidence 
to allow researchers to make well-informed decisions about how we do trials. Researchers doing trials, the funders paying for them and people taking part in trials cannot always be sure that the way the trial is being done is as effective and as efficient as it should be. And it's often the decisions are based on assumptions about efficiency, assumptions about how effective a particular means of recruiting participants might be, how retaining participants, and sometimes because those questions are not being asked at all. It is the assumption is that this is the way it should be done. So SWOTs evaluate um, different ways of doing trial process. So that could be evaluating, for example, different methods of recruiting participants into a surgical trial, different methods of retaining them. So the dual two sides of the same coin, recruitment and retention. So helping them to stay in the study, um, uh, different ways of reporting the findings to different stakeholder audiences and evaluating which might be more effective because it's highly likely that the methods of reporting trial findings might vary depending on the needs and the audience that you're actually speaking to. Some work we have done with patients, so with the public members, uh, um, have demonstrated to us that the last thing they want to read is a complex trial report that's not written in plain language. And that's quite often how we still report the findings of trials across settings. So the key features of a study within a trial or of a SWOT are that they resolve important un uncertainties about the processes or the steps used in randomized trials. They're usually embedded within a host trial, although there have been some examples of studies that are answering primary trials methodology questions being referred to as a SWOT, but not necessarily embedded within a host trial. Um, critically for the PIs who are running the host trial and the team that are responsible for that, um, they shouldn't affect the scientific integrity of the host trial for two reasons. Well, number one, the integrity of the host trial um, is critical to answering the clinical question that trial is set up to do so, but also in terms of um, if you want to get buy-in of a methods question into a host trial, it is not going to be appreciated if it does jeopardize or undermine the scientific integrity of the host trial. Um, however, there needs to be good collaboration between the teams who are conducting the clinical trial, and if it's a separate team, or individuals who or are those responsible for the methods question. And the best methods questions are answered within trials when the clinical host trial team and the methods team work very closely together, or, are the, or indeed are the same team. A SWOT should have a formal protocol, um, uh, just like the host trial would have. Um, the SWOT can be evaluated within a single or multiple host trial, um, um, and they can be often well suited for running across more than one host trial, either at the same time or sequentially. They provide data to inform the design and conduct of future trials, but they could potentially also provide data to inform decisions about the ongoing host trial. Concrete example would be if you're comparing two different methods of recruitment of participants and you find early that one has been demonstrated to be much more effective than the other, you may decide to flip to the more effective recruitment measure if that question has been answered midway through the host trial. If you're looking for a SWOT inspiration, um, you've already had that from a number of the speakers today. Um, and for further inspiration in terms of what methods you might ask, um, you can find off the shelf SWOTs for various trials methodology questions um, at the website that's here at the QUB SWOT register. Um, so Googling uh, QUB SWOT register will bring you to well, 160 um, protocols, uh, very short, very simple um, protocols for primary trials methodology question, which are free to be used and adapted. You should also consider looking perhaps at the prioritization exercises that have been done that have identified what the top 10 uncertainties are around trial recruitment. So this is one example here in, in recruitment and an example here of retention. And both of those top 10 questions for recruitment quest uncertainties, questions that you might choose to answer within a trial 
um, are uh, for recruitment to trials and retention to trials are available on this website here, which is PriorityResearch.ie. And uh, those questions, many of them looking at them recently in preparation for this talk will be highly relevant to those of you who are involved closely in trials in surgery. So the references I've used are here and thank you very much. And I look forward to the 